What's going on guys? Morty Mouse in the house and welcome back for the second episode of Extinct where we discuss the rise and fall of theme park attractions that no longer exist in their original form. Today we'll be discussing another one of my all-time favorites and an all-time favorite of many of you out there judging by our poll on Twitter. Horizons, a 14 minute and 45 second omni mover dark ride attraction that was sort of a spiritual successor or some would even say sequel to the Carousel of Progress. It's home, Epcot's Future World at the Walt Disney World Resort. As we delve further into the series, we will be discussing some history of the theme parks themselves. But to give you a quick overview, Epcot the theme park, not Epcot, Walt's original idea was meant to be a sort of permanent World's Fair. Says uh, World's Fair. That showcased man's greatest achievements, technological innovations, and progress, as well as international culture. And what made World's Fairs possible? Sponsorships. Corporate sponsorships, to be exact. Go be the money! And these sponsorships worked in a mutually beneficial manner. The company would help sponsor the pavilions financially, and in return, they would be able to put their name and logo all over the pavilion and attractions. They would even have a part in deciding what the attraction would consist of, with Disney overseeing the ride's construction and design. Disney was able to get General Electric to agree on sponsoring one of their pavilions once again. GE had sponsored Progress Land, a Walt Disney presentation at the New York World's Fair in the 1964-1965 season. Then, when it was moved to Disneyland in 1967 under the name The Carousel of Progress, as well as sponsoring Disney World's clone of the attraction, which opened in 1975. The new pavilion GE agreed to sponsor at Epcot would eventually become Horizons. GE CEO Reginald Jones and his eventual replacement Jack Welch wanted the ride to revolve around Thomas Edison, his invention the light bulb, and how General Electric came to be. After some heated debate, Disney flexed their muscles and got them to agree to forget the whole electricity theme and have the attraction showcase the future of America instead. Then, in order to appeal to a larger global audience, it would then be changed to the future of the world. In its concept phase, Horizons was named Century 3. The origin of this pertains to the third century of the USA's existence. That would be 1976 through 2076. Seeing this name as confusing to potential guests, it was then changed to Future Probe, which also wouldn't last long due to the medical connotations of the word probe. <laughs> or you know, aliens. Disney and GE would finally agree on the name Horizons. The building that would house the attraction would be gold in color and was designed to look like a spaceship. With an original budget of about $73 million, its final cost would be about $60 million after budget cuts. This reduced the size of the pavilion by about 35%, or 600 feet in total. Designed by Marty Sklar and a superstar team of many other well-known Imagineers, it sat within 137,000 square feet and two floors. The attraction was an Omnimover ride that was suspended from a track above. Think about it as if Spaceship Earth and Peter Pan had a baby. A beautiful, amazing baby. It would also include two Omnisphere screens as well within the ride. The end product would be a pavilion that would encompass all other Future World pavilions and elements. These included communication, community interaction, energy, transportation, anatomy, physiology, along with man's relationship to the sea, land, air, and space. It would be Future World's crowning jewel, and it was awesome. It would open on Epcot's first birthday, October 1st, 1983. Happy birthday, Epcot. And it quickly became the fan favorite the Imagineers knew it would be. Where else could you get a glimpse into the not so distant future? It was everything an 80s kid could dream of. And we had big dreams. The ride starts at Futureport. You board your Omnimover as you begin your journey into the future. The vehicle sits three to four passengers at a time. Suddenly you're flying amongst the clouds. They glow before your eyes. You get a really special treat as you realize that the narrators are John and Sarah, the parents from the Carousel of Progress. They've become grandparents and will be visiting their three adult children who just so happen to live in three very different types of cities. Once the clouds subside, you are now floating through darkness. Sketches of Leonardo da Vinci's contraptions would light up through the darkness. A scene inspired by Jules Verne's novel From the Earth to the Moon makes an appearance. Then Jules Verne himself shows up as well inside a capsule lit up with a lantern heading for the moon. And guess what? He brought a chicken along. Quack, 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 quack. 
then off to Paris where we see a glimpse of how Jules Verne saw the future. Now we're back to the future. And by future, I mean the way someone from the 80s would have seen it. A contemporary style apartment. That's one heck of a view. Robots doing chores. Then a version of the future that seems like someone from the 50s imagined it. Neon lights, jetpacks, spire-like towers. You then enter the Omni Theater with projected film surrounding you. We arrive at Nova site, where we get to see our narrators from their home. Apparently, transportation is some type of teleportation because visiting family has never been quicker. There is a good news. That's our daughter, she's talking. She's doing wonders out there on the desert farm. You reach Mesa Verde, which depicts arid zone agriculture, where one of their daughters lives. Once a barren desert, now green as far as the eye can see. Next is Sea Castle Research Base, which depicts ocean colonization. And then finally, Bravo Centauri, which of course depicts the colonization of space. After seeing how the family members all live within their unique environments, you reach the part of the attraction that blows the finale of any other attraction out of the water. That's right. You get to choose the final part of your adventure. Choose your tomorrow. Three buttons light up in front of each passenger. You then vote. Majority rules. Omega Centauri for space, Mesa Verde for desert, or Sea Castle Resort for undersea. The ride then takes you on a roughly 30 second simulator ride over and around the biome choice you and your fellow passengers made. These were made possible through massive scale models and were built by 30 model makers at the Burbank Airport in Burbank, California. For example of the size of these things, the Mesa Verde model was 32 feet by 75 feet. Yeah, that's pretty massive. To this day, it's the longest continuously shot miniature sequence ever made. So what happened? Why would Disney close this fan favorite attraction? Why would they close a popular ride in an area of the park that they so desperately needed rides at the time? Well, glad you asked. In 1993, General Electric pulled sponsorship from the pavilion after it expired on September 30th of that year. Within months, all the signs and any evidence that it ever sponsored the ride were pulled. And a year afterwards, Horizons would close down in December 1994 with no reasons given. But then out of nowhere, the ride reopened almost exactly one year later in December of 1995. Horizons was back and many fans of the ride rejoiced. Unfortunately, this reopening was pretty much out of desperation. You see, two other classic rides would also be closing down to make way for new attractions. World of Motion would become Test Track and Universe of Energy would be retrofitted to become Ellen's Energy Adventure. I cannot wait to talk about those. So in all reality, Disney had to have another ride open in Future World and Horizons was its only choice. It would of course shut its doors forever after Epcot closed for the day January 9th, 1999. There were lots of rumors surrounding its closing. The first were of course after General Electric pulled sponsorship from the attraction. Without the financial backing of a sponsorship, Disney would refurbish the ride less often, then not at all, eventually leaving animatronics and parts of the ride in disrepair. Disney just wasn't ready to put the money back into modernizing Horizons after the whole Euro Disney debacle. You'll see that that's a trend in a lot of these videos. This would of course make the most sense, but the second rumor was the one that everyone believed, or at least wanted to believe. I even remember it being spread around at the time. Maybe it just made more sense to fans of the ride. Maybe this was what some of us wanted to believe was the actual reason for the closing. A sinkhole. 
That's right. Many believed that a sinkhole had compromised Horizon's structural integrity to the point of near collapse. If this were true, it would have taken a large sum of money in order to rebuild the infrastructure around the pavilion in order to reopen the ride. Now, Imagineer Marty Sklar did verify parts of this rumor, though he never clarified whether or not it was the reason behind the ride's closure. Other Imagineers had stated that the sinkhole was much closer to the old Odyssey restaurant near the World Showcase. So with no clear answer, once again, Horizon stood empty. On September 23rd, 1999, sadly all Horizon signs were removed from the pavilion. Then supposedly on October 1st, members of the press were allowed to ride Horizons. This not only gave fans hope that it would someday return, but it also proved that the ride was still intact. Then on January 1st, 2000, Horizons did not open for large crowds on Millennium Night. Fans finally came to the realization that this was really it. In July of 2000, it would be demolished to make way for Mission Space, a thrill ride space simulator, which would open in 2003. The loss of Horizons hit the Disney community where it hurts most, our hearts. Many saw it as the perfect dark ride, the best to ever exist, and many still do. It was the epitome of everything Epcot was supposed to be. And it was the final blow to what Epcot was meant to be. A representation of Epcot in all its glory. And it will truly be missed. Thank you guys so much for joining us today for our second episode of Extinct. If you enjoyed this video, make sure you smash that like button and let us know why in the comments below. If not, then don't be afraid to dislike and do the same. Subscribe for more videos like this, click that bell to make sure you see them, and please share with your friends to support us. I'm your host, Marty Mouse. I'll see you later, or I'll see you at another time.